money on his own. <laughs> so that means less money being spent for diapers. And so we're slowly getting out of that, slowly getting out of that lifestyle with him. But um, absolutely, that's, that's wonderful. And I'm sure all of us in this one another. We all love each other. And it, it really is different for me to sit behind a computer screen, to sit behind a cell phone at home, uh, talking to you guys when I can't see your face. <laughs> But I'm hoping, and I'm glad you're able to get it because speaking with Janet this morning, there's been some complications with uploading some, like our Bible studies we've been having. YouTube sometimes, Wi-Fi connection will be bad and it won't upload or something happens. So after today's service, I'm going to make sure all the ducks are in a row and that we're able to listen to the sermons and the Bible studies because as far as I know, we have people living in foreign countries that are listening in. People... Well, you'll never meet in your life until you go to be with the Lord. And you never know, they'd be like, hey, I heard your voice in that recording. I highly doubt that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm so grateful we can actually meet today. Lord willing, next week we'll be able to do the same, and then the week after that, but who knows? We just go day by day, right? It's supposed to be warmer this week. Is it? Oh, wow. Heat wave. That's a heat wave. <laughs> stores such as Walmart, Amazon, eBay, all big retail stores, Target, you can think of some that come to your mind. All these people will make tons of money today. I mean tons of money today. So how I like to do statistics and all that, took some time out to just, I thought to myself, how much are these stores going to make today? Well, as crazy as it may sound for today, February 14, 2021, there's a wallethub.com estimates that only $21.8 billion will be spent just for today. Only $21.8 only $21. billion. Thankfully, Laura and I have already decided that we're not going to get each other anything for Valentine's Day today. Uh, we do that every single year, but we figure this year our love is good enough. <laughs> Praise God. Because <laughs> I tell you, the amount of money with having to remember all the birthdays and all the other holidays, that's hard on a man. It is for me. It's hard on me. Uh, but today, $21.8 billion will be spent just for today. And according to WalletHub.com, that's around $164.76 spent by just one person. Um, and here's some other interesting facts concerning today. So according to WalletHub.com, this is where I got all this information. It is estimated that men, that men will spend twice as much as women. Amen. On, on, on average for Valentine's Day today. It's estimated that men will spend around $231 and women will spend around $101. That's just their estimation. Also, the amount of Americans today will spend $4.1 billion on jewelry, $2 billion on flowers, $2 billion on candy, which equals up to a total of $8.1 billion. And most of that candy has gone to Jeremiah. <laughs> also, 33% overall of online dating activity will increase across America between February 1st, well, that's already passed, and today, February 14th. So there's a 33% increase of people looking for love. <laughs> and 53% of women, 53% of women say they would break up with their significant other today if they don't get anything from their significant other. <laughs> So, men, <laughs> women, <laughs> just in case. Many people think of Valentine's Day as being a day for couples only, but that's not true at all. That's, that's never been true at all. Valentine's Day is where all of us are supposed to come together and celebrate love. We're supposed to celebrate friendships and admiration for one another. But far too many of us, though, after today, will, will begin to love less throughout the week. What I mean by that is today is focused on loving each other, loving people, loving your friends. Just because on the calendar it says Valentine's Day. We know that our wives and our maybe your friends and your family are expecting some gift today. Maybe your love, maybe candy, flowers, hopefully not $2 billion worth. But maybe Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, as we get farther away from Valentine's Day, we'll be tempted to love differently on those days than we do today. 
All of us need to remember that as the church, as representatives of Jesus Christ, as children of God, the world knows us, and I've said this over and over, the world knows us by our love for one another. This is exactly how the world knows us. According to Jesus, this is precisely what he says in John chapter 13, verse 35. If you have your Bible, you can turn there with me, or you can just listen. It's just, it's just one verse. John chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus says this in his own words. I'll start with verse 20, uh, 34. I give you a new command. Love one another, just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciple, if you love one another. So, I want to be crystal clear. Love, love is the defining characteristic of the church. Love, in other words, is the mark of the church. So, I'm going to ask you a personal question. You don't have to answer this out loud. You never do. When I ask you questions, don't, don't think you ever have to answer it out loud. How are you doing when it comes to this? Personally, think to yourself, how are you doing when it comes to loving your brothers and sisters in Christ? Or just loving your neighbor in general? Especially, how are you doing with those who you, how are you doing when it comes to loving those who you disagree with? Politically? Spiritually? Or in general, about anything? Are you loving that person whom you disagree with Politically, spiritually, or just in general, just as Jesus loved that person? God knows how Gary Johnson's doing with this, and he knows how you're doing with this. So, if you're here today on Valentine's Day, struggling to live up to today's expectations that everyone thinks you should live up to, if you're struggling to love your spouse, to love your friends, to love your enemies, to love your family, or even your everyday stranger, can I suggest that there may, in fact, be a, di a deeper issue at hand. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. Or again, you can just listen. I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. John writes this. Revel Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. John says this. Write to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Thus says the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Verse 2. I know your works, your labor, and your endurance, and that you cannot tolerate evil people. You tested those who called themselves apostles and are not, and you have found them to be liars. I know that you have persevered and endured hardships for the sake of my name and have not grown weary, but I have this against you. You have abandoned the love that you had at first. So you see, the church in Ephesus, they were a hardworking, persevering, long-suffering church that did not tolerate evil people. This group of Christians in Ephesus had a skill of being able to tell whether or not a person was exactly who they said they were. So in other words, they were the fact checkers of Christianity back in their time. They, they could know whether or not you had people claiming to be apostles when they were not. They knew their Bibles. They knew what, how, to, how to test somebody. And they found out that some people, unfortunately, were not who they said they were. But however, even though they could be praised in all of these areas, there was something very important that they were lacking. And in verse 4, John, Jesus says this, But I have this against you, that you have abandoned your first love. So what can we learn from this? So the church at Ephesus was really good at keeping rules and regulations. Tony Evans had this to say about this passage of Scripture. He said they had the, they had the correct doctrine. The church in Ephesus had the correct doctrine but they did not have the correct heart. So the problem was not, all, was not that they didn't love Jesus. The problem was that they didn't love him first. And Tony Evans also had this to say about the church in Ephesus, which is very beneficial for all of us, I think. He said, as with romantic love between a man and a woman, first love always involves passion. 
Yet there was not a passionate pursuit of an intimate relationship with Christ. They were merely following a program. Duty had replaced devotion. Duty had replaced devotion. So maybe of a, maybe some of us woke up this morning who really didn't want to get out of bed. Who really didn't want to make the trip here. And But nonetheless, we're here. Praise God. However, maybe some of us are here, and you examine this yourself, not out of devotion of Christ, but rather we're here because we're expected to be here. Or we're here because we think it's our duty to be here. And if this is the case, if Gary Johnson's here because he's just, it's my duty to be here, I've got it all wrong. Because you see, religion is rooted within a performance-based program. Religion is rooted within a performance-based program. And when we're religious, we come to church because we have to. We come to church because it's our obligation. And we keep commandments simply because we're expected to keep commandments. This is what was happening in Ephesus. The problem was they had forsook their first love. And their first love, of course, being Jesus. They were correcting false teachers and enduring hardships all while having left their first love. So as a church... Philadelphia Congregational Christian Church, we must take heed as God's people and not think that this can't happen to us. Because this can happen to us. We must take heed with what John said here. Because the same thing, again, that what happened in Ephesus can happen here in Selma. But what matters the most to Jesus is coming to church because we love him, not because it's our duty to be here. Now, granted, if you have a long night on Saturday night, whatever, Saturday Whenever you meet, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Churches meet at different times. Sometimes it's hard to make yourself wake up that next day. Sometimes you need that extra dose of coffee. And so it's no walk in the park every day. But the heart of the matter is that Jesus wants us to come here, fellowship with one another, because we love him. Because we love each other. Not because, well, I know Jesus wants us to come here. I know he wants us to be together. Jesus wants us to have the right heart. He does not want us to live a life of religion. People don't want any part of religion. From my experience of talking to people, they want a relationship. They want something that's real. They don't want it based on outward works and performances. They want the heart of a person to be changed. So also, if you turn with me to, to John 21, verse 15 to 19, John is completing um, his gospel account. He's almost at the end of it. And we read something really interesting about Jesus' conversation. Jesus had risen from the dead, and Jesus, risen from the dead, is having breakfast. <laughs> Jesus is having breakfast with Peter, starting in verse 15. Here's our conversation. John chapter 21, starting with verse 15. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? More than these. Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs, Jesus told him. A second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told him. He asked him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. So here we see Jesus asking Peter a specific question over and over and over again. And he's doing this with a purpose. And again, I'm going to be, I'm going to be annoying again. Catch this. Jesus asked him again, do you love me? Understand that Jesus wasn't asking Peter, do you love me enough to meet with each other on Sunday? Do you, do, do you love me enough to casually get to the poor? No, Jesus was asking Peter, do you love me enough to lead my people and to eventually die for the sake of my name in the near future? Context, that's what he was saying. Because in the context, Jesus says there will be a time in your life where someone will bind your hands and take you where you don't want to go. And if you know anything about Christian history, you will know that Peter was crucified upside down for his sake. That's exactly what happened. Jesus knew what he was talking about. Peter said, you know everything. Jesus was like, yeah, I do. And this is what's going to happen. 
So I believe Jesus wants me to ask everyone here a question, including Gary Johnson himself. Do you love him? I'm going to ask you again. Do you love him? I'm going to ask you again. Do you love Jesus? What I mean by this, do you love him more than your spouse? Do you love him more than your closest friend? Do you love him more than your family, your children, or your neighbor? If you don't, well, Jesus wants this to change right now. He wants this to change today. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, your cooperation with the Holy Spirit, Jesus wants us to be the best disciples that we could ever be. Right now, starting today. So when it comes to discipleship, which is an interesting topic, a very deep topic in and of itself, this is serious business. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. Jesus is talking to his people about the conditions on being a disciple. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. Jesus has something to say to anyone who wants to be his disciple. I must make a point. There's a difference between being a child of God and a disciple. I just want to make that clear. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. Jesus says this. The one who loves a father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The one who loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Verse 38. And whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Verse 39. Anyone who finds his life will lose it. And everyone who loses his life because of me will find it. So as you can see, being a disciple, according to these words, is serious business. It's no walk in the park. It's not always easy to be a disciple of Jesus, but nonetheless, that's what all of us are called to be. That's where the process of sanctification comes in within our own life. And for me, for Gary Johnson, I have found that it's most easiest to be a disciple of Jesus when I'm loving him. Rather than trying to be his disciple when I don't love him. For me, it's easier to do it when I'm loving him. So I'm going to ask you again. I'm going to be annoying again. Do you love him? Do you love Jesus? Does Gary Johnson love Jesus? If we have, in fact, fallen into the trap that the Christians in Ephesus did, we need to go back to the drawing board and ask, and ask for ourselves a few questions. I have some questions written down here. What caused this to happen? You ask yourself this. If this is what happens, if this has happened to you, if not, praise God. But if it has, what caused this to happen? Jesus wanted the Christians in Ephesus to repent of this, to turn away from their lifestyle right here and to come back to loving Jesus. Remember, they were doing all the right things. They were keeping the commandments. They were testing false teachers. But the heart of the matter was that they did not love Jesus. It was not motivated with love. So ask yourself, what caused this to happen? What can I do differently? Is there something I need to give up? Do I need to behave differently? You see, here's the fact of the matter at hand today. You and I can come to church every Sunday. We can sing all the right songs. We can pray all the right prayers. But if our hearts are not into what we're doing today, then, well, we're just practicing religion. That's what we're doing today. If our heart is not in it, if that relationship with Jesus is not in it, all we're doing is practicing religion today. Something that most people, as I already said, don't want anything to do with. So this, this, fun, this leads me to my conclusion. I'm going to be annoying again. Do you love him? Is Jesus your first love? Not your second. Is he your first? Or has something or someone replaced him? 1 Corinthians 16, 22. Again, feel free to turn to it if you'd like. If not, I'll just you can listen to it. Let me read it from the Christian Standard Bible. 1 Corinthians 16, 22, the Apostle Paul says the following. Verse 22, chapter 16, 1 Corinthians. If anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be upon him. Or, in other translations, he is to be accursed. How does that make you feel? How does that make you feel that the Apostle Paul takes loving Jesus to that extent? This is an extreme thing for Paul to say. If you remember the book of Galatians, Paul said, if anyone preaches another gospel, he's to be accursed. Paul says right here in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 22, if you don't love Jesus, you're to be accursed. 
Loving Jesus is what matters. Not keeping rules and regulations without love. Not portraying yourself as holy. Not portraying yourself as, hey, I come to church, I do the right thing. This and that, this and that. What matters to Jesus the most is the changed heart. That is what matters. Christians everywhere are called to love Jesus with a love that is willing to forsake all at any time, all because of who he is and what he's done for us. And remember, as mentioned earlier, according to Jesus, love is the defining mark of the church. And I want to close with one scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 to 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 to 3. Many of us know this section of scripture really well. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 to 3, Paul the Apostle says this. If I speak human or angelic tongues, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Verse 2. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give away all my possessions, and if I give over my body in order to boast, but do not have love, I gain absolutely nothing. Now, these are powerful words from the Word of God. Again, we can do all the right things, we can give to the poor, we can come to church, we can even give our lives for Christ. But if we have not love, if we don't have love, profit is nothing. It's a waste of time, in other words. So, as I said, we can we do all the right things. We come to church every Sunday. Lately, it's only been about once a month. <laughs> but that's okay. We can't help that. The fact of the matter is, if we don't have love and we do all these things, profits is nothing. Loving Jesus and loving others is truly the defining mark of the church. And right now, the times we live in, that's a lot. we need a lot of that. And the church is supposed, supposed to be... The light on a hill, this, a city that cannot, the light on a hill, the light of the world, the city that on the hill that cannot be hidden. We need to be that representation of love. Period. That's what we need to be. So, I want to conclude with saying go out today. Go out today. It's Valentine's Day. Go celebrate with your spouse, your friends, your family. Have a night on the town. Don't recommend you spend $21.8 billion, but hey, it's your checking, checking account. That's what you want to do. Go right ahead. But as you go about the rest of your day and the rest of this week, remember to not fall into the trap that Ephesus fell into. Love Jesus first before anyone or anything. It's easy to say, right? Because when it comes to your own desires, you have to, you have to really weigh them. Is this what Jesus would want? Is this choice I'm about to make what Jesus would want? Is this what would glorify Jesus the most? You have to make that up yourself. But love Jesus first before anyone or anything. And if I can do this in any way, I'm sure all of us here would be willing to help one another. Let each other know. That's what we as a church are here for. And this paper I passed around, I want us to all take that for a second. I want us just to read this. I want us, and then we will close with prayer. This is a poem that is written by a woman named Deborah, Deborah Ann. I have, this, I have the source where I took this poem from. I don't know this woman. I, I absolutely not. But her poem went right with today's message. So I want to read this. Never forget your first love is what it was titled. Remember your first love. How you once felt. How the sound of his name made your heart melt. Remember the hope. How it lifted up your soul. When his stripes, when by his stripes you were made whole. Remember the joy, how much you were elated when your life to Jesus you first dedicated. Remember the grace, how it washed over you. How God's loving mercy made everything new. Remember your first love, how Jesus, how did Jesus make you feel? If not, it's time for you to get back to your holy I think that was a great poem, and I think it fits right into today's message. So, throughout this week, love Jesus first and throughout the rest of your life. That's what he calls us to do. Let us pray.
Lord, thank you for the time we've been able to listen about what you have said about being a disciple of yours and reading about what temptation that Ephesus fell into. This was a church who had the right doctrines. They were doing everything right. They were keeping the commandments. They were calling out false teachers. They were persevering. They were enduring hardship. But the problem at the end of the day was deeper. They did not love you. For, their love for you was not first in their life. Lord, help us to always keep you first. Help us to keep our love ignited for you every single day, especially during the hardships, the hard days where it's hard to do so. Please be with us. Help, help us to always focus on you. Help us to set our mind on things that are above where you are seated, knowing that one day you will call us home to be with you. All of us here want to please you. We want to do your will. And we want to be the, the light of the world, the city on a hill. Lord, help us to shine our brightest when it's most hard to do. We thank you for this time we're able to come together today. It's been a while. This is, feels like a luxury. Thank you for this blessing of being able to come together. We pray that this will be the case this Wednesday. If not, bring us back together Sunday. All being according to your will. We pray that you'll be with us. And that you always protect us and guide us to be with those who have been mentioned who need prayers today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.